possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTE GA podcast. This is the hurling show. We don't normally split them up, but you know, you only preview the championship once, uh, we hope. So this is it. This is the hurling preview. And I have Connor McKeown, Brendan Cummins, and as always, Roy O'Neill along with me. How are we doing, folks? Good, Hello. Mikey. All right. Good stuff, sure. It's, um, I was just thinking to myself, uh, Connor, the, the GA Championship often starts a little bit off Broadway, or literally off Broadway. A Connacht Championship match in um in the Gaelic grounds or in Gaelic Park, which uh you know is probably not is pre- precedes every other game by about two weeks, and you don't get any proper championship. You know, you don't get a proper championship weekend until about three weekends into it. So between football and hurling, we have we have ten games this weekend. You wouldn't say any of them are outside of one monster hurling match are absolute clinkers, but it is nice, I think to start with a rush rather than a trickle, isn't it? I think it probably is. Like, I was one of those people who always felt the GAA should nearly contrive a draw in such a way that you had a big match to start it all off. But, but the other thing as well is um, we're so close to the end of the league, as in it was only last weekend. And in a lot of ways, for things like this to preview the games, it's, it's such a good thing because, you know, I was only lo- looking through the list of counties there and going over the previous results. And all of a sudden, their previous results are far more relevant um, in the context of next week or the following week than they were before. Like the, you know, the, the, the Cork-Limerick game, for instance, is so fresh in the memory that, you know, in the usual season, teams would disappear after the league and you see them six weeks later and fellas are all different shapes and sizes and playing in different positions. But I think just even for the purposes of analysis here, uh, you know, the evidence that we have, I think, is far more relevant than it might usually be. Yeah, absolutely. That's true, Brendan, isn't it? We're, um, I think... We're not going to see anything too different. A, a team's performance in the last couple of rounds of the league is is pretty much what we're going to get. The managers can't really work the oracle in the space of 10 or 11 days, can they? Yeah, I think we saw a lot of that during the league. And take Cork and Tipperary, for example, to start the lead. They went to the extreme with the tactic where Tip gave the ball to the opposition full back line. Uh, what right or wrong, they just said they'd see what would happen. Cork, of course, were giving the ball to their own full back line to see what would happen. I think as the league drew on, I think Cork would have been happier that last game, it didn't have such a big turnaround against Galway. Everything looked going okay. They were seven points up a little bit into the second half and then the wheels came off the wagon again. So, yeah, some teams have had been winners and losers through the league. Um, but overall, I think they will all have gotten what they want. And I agree there that, that certainly coming into the championship, there is a bit of momentum there um, uh, for, for each one of the teams throughout the league. But the ones who hadn't gone well, they're racked with a lot of, they look very fragile. I take the likes of Wexford and Dublin and say, and Cork, for example, they look like they haven't had a strong league and it would have benefited them a bit more to have a few more internal games before the championship comes. But the fella says we are where we are now for everybody. I'm surprised to hear you um, lumping Cork in there with admittedly Dublin and my own Wexford who, who, who don't look like they've quite... Um, you know, reached the, the, the levels they wanted. But Cork, I would have thought, you don't think, you know, lots of goals. Okay, a, an, an issue with restarts, as we say, but um, it wasn't it wasn't all bad, was it? No, the- no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't all bad. But I mean, if you are trying to go with a game plan, you'd like to have a little bit more green shoots, I think, of it actually working to instill more belief into the players than what we've seen. I think there's no doubt that Cork have a style of play that they're going to run with now. I, I think they'll probably go 40% short and 60% long. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what long is going to look like for them. Um, because I think it was about 2018 thing they played Tipperary, but Torres Luke Mead was exceptionally good on the puck outs, even though he didn't get on an awful lot of them. He ran to make space for Lehan and Harnady and those around him. So I think that's what I'm most excited about the scene in Cork, what the long game is going to look like. I've no doubt they have prepared for that and they haven't shown us their hand yet on that. But it's certainly if you're looking at, at, at Cork over the course of the league, there hasn't been a massive amount of confidence, I'd say, that I get that that short game is going to work in the long term. So I'm just looking forward to seeing what plan B is going to look like now when they when they play Limerick, because there's no way, I think, on this God's earth, you can run the ball from your own 21 to the Limerick 65 without some of those big guys turning you upside down. What do you make of that, Rory? Is Kieran Kingston playing us all for fools? Has he got, has he got plan B ready to roll? 
I think they will they will definitely come with something that we probably haven't seen. I think with Don with someone like Don Logrady in the back room, I there would be a, there, there would absolutely have been an element of rope dope, I think, against Limerick in the league. And I think they will have a sort of a mixed game, I would imagine, where they will look to go short at times and they will look to go long. The problem going long is you're dependent hugely on the fitness and form of Seamus Harnady, which is questionable on both fronts, both from a fitness point of view and form. I mean, he's been an incredible servant, real war horse for Cork for many years at this stage, but he's racked up, you know, a fair, a fair bit of mileage and body starts to take its toll. You know, he's probably the only ball winner Cork really had in that half forward line. So if he's not fit and if he's not firing, then I don't really see where, where they're going to get any joy if they do go along. They also, you have to remember, have effectively a brand new goalkeeper. It's not Anthony Nash that is that's pinging these out. And look, Brendan would probably be far better than I to um, understand the vagaries of puck out strategies, which are going to be crucial if they're going to have any chance against Limerick. But at the same time, I think a fast ground, fast ball, the slitter is going to be moving a lot more quickly than it was during the winter I think that will be a leveler in terms of their ability to get at teams they do have plenty of pace in the forwards they're you know whether or not they can clear up all their injuries and sort out one or two issues in the full back line Colm Spillane would be a massive addition if he can make it now I don't think he will um, and then you probably We'll be looking at a full back line himself, maybe Owen Cadigan, and if the two Cadigans are fit, and then Sean O'Donoghue. And I wouldn't necessarily have too much fear for that. Just, there's just a problem is I don't necessarily see them being able to mix it in a physical sense for 70 minutes with Limerick. So it is going to have to be a mix from Cork in terms of they are going to have to mix short and long. And if they can do that effectively, I think they have the skills to take on any team. But as Brendan said, you know, the the downer on the Galway match, I'm sure will rankle a little bit to throw like the 12 point turnaround. It's not a great uh, launch pad going into championship. Um, just before we go off Cork, Brendan, I will go, I will spin back to the goalkeepers there quickly. It's an interesting dynamic, isn't it? Having, having Cork have had ridiculously few goalkeepers in the last 30 years. It's a bit like the Dublin football team. It's, yeah. it, it's a torch that's handed on. And, and now it's funnily after Anthony Nash has done his stint, we, we have uh, Patrick Collins with, with his brother, in support it's it's kind of a unique situation isn't it and how much like you would have obviously had a very fine goalkeeper you know kind of on your coattails kind of pressuring you and training and kind of looking to take your place from you that's very important with goalkeepers isn't it because there's only one in a team and if they feel they're untouchable or that the the backup isn't ready to take over then that's not a healthy situation for the team so that's quite an interesting dynamic they have down there isn't it yeah, it is. There's, look, there's no doubt about that. I know with Darren Deeson, he was jumping in my heels and, oh, I was better because Darren was getting better. And I always, and people would look at me going, why would you do that? Why don't you just not help him? But we would have helped each other. But on match day, whether Darren started or I started, we're 100% behind each other. But you do need that, I, uh, that pressure. Uh, and I think, but as far as Patrick Collins is concerned, the Cork and that game against Limerick, he still found his targets with the puck outs. They were turned over. But now, if he was skying balls into the stand or hitting hitting play receivers yeah. on the ankles, I go, uh-oh. Yeah. But he wasn't like. Mm. It was just that you are now, Patrick, you hit the ball short. We don't care what happens. It's the rope-a-dope stuff, in fairness, I think is where it's at. But he found his man every time. A couple were intercepted, which is going to happen. It's not a game of perfect. But more often than not, I was impressed with the fact that the ball went to hand. What happened after that was the cock player was turned over. But from a goalkeeping solely point of view, I was seriously impressed that all of the time, or majority of the time, sorry, he was going to hand, which means that he can cope with pressure and he can cope with going short. Even when it's going wrong for the receiver, he still puts it in his hand, which is a great sign of a young goalkeeper like that. I go back to the Galway goalkeeper last year in Crow Park. There was balls flying over lads' heads that were going into the stand. It, it, it didn't have the smack of the same composure as Collins and a, and a goalie in his first year as well. So for me, I was seriously impressed with the way the league that Patrick Collins had. And uh, he is well set to set in, step into the shoes, I think, of, of Nash and even the guy who started all this hassle for all those goalies don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, 
staying with Munster, uh, Connor, and we will get to this weekend's games kind of towards the end of the podcast. Um, we'll kind of look at broader picture now. Tipperary, you, you did write a piece kind of very early in the league, maybe even before it started um, for independent.e, kind of just looking at Tipperary, the generation game, and, you know, how many of these this incredible crop of under 20s and minors are ready to step in now to what is considered an aging Tipperary team. But I think given the way hurling and sports science in general is going, I think calling the Tipperary class of 2010 aging at this stage might be a little bit ageist, but it hasn't, it hasn't probably, maybe we would have expected a little bit more uh, regeneration over the four games with is or five games. Is that fair to say? Yeah, probably. Um, but I suppose it just depends on where you see the need. Uh, like, where does Liam Sheedy need to bring through players? You know, bringing through players for the sake of bringing through players is never a particularly smart thing to do. Uh, like Paddy Cadell, I would, be, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Paddy Cadell started in midfield, maybe with Alan Flynn. Um, you know, he's he, like he's definitely. It's only a matter of time, I think, before he's a, a regular starter in yeah. the Tipperary team. But the, the, I suppose the two things that that maybe we looked at the Tipperary team and thought that they might need. One of them is pace up front. Um, you know, who's going to break the line? Who's going to be the player that goes through on goal? Um, you know, like you look and it's the McGraths and Bubbles and Jason Ford and they're such sweet hurlers. It's very, very difficult to make any argument to leave them out. Um, particularly now when goals are kind of drying up an awful lot, um, when the majority of scores are coming from further out the pitch from really sweet ball strikers, you know, it's, it's no surprise that you see people like Noel McGrath and say Donald Bork in Dublin and hurlers like that that are playing out around the middle, John Conlon and Clare as well. Um, even Cahill Mannion in, in Galway. So I think they can get a lot of scores from those players still that, 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 that the kind of the bit of age isn't um, taken away from their potency, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but again, breaking the line and going through for goal, like, you know, top teams, are, okay, Limerick, I think are, are freaks nearly in that regard. And the other thing for me was their half-back line. You know, like every team is going to have to look at their half-back line this year because for the first time, I think, since Kilkenny in their pump, what you have is a, a, a kind of a runaway favourite in Limerick, you know, that if you have designs on winning the All-Ireland, you can't, like, you know, it's a dereliction of duty not to examine how Limerick play and try and find a way to, uh, to stop them. Like against Cork that day when the 33 points and 20 wides or whatever it was, you know, I think Tom Morrissey and Keane Lynch both got four points from the half-forward line. Colin Coughlin got two from the half-back line. Uh, like, they, they, they got about 10 or 12 points from their middle eight. Um, and I know that's a growing trend in hurling, but you're, you're just going to have to have, I don't think having Paddy Marr following Gerald Hegarty into midfield or Tom Morrissey into midfield, that's not a good sort of plan to have. And I'm not surprised to see him uh, play full back during the league as well. So, you know, that bit of mobility in the half back line, you know, with Seamus Kennedy or maybe Barry Heffernan or Michael Breen, I think that's maybe where we'll see a couple of changes in the Tipperary setup. But I think in terms of personnel, other than Paddy Cadell, I can't see too many other players breaking. I think Mark Kyo and Jake Morris give them great options, but um, you know, it's hard to make a case to leave out any of the players that we were talking about earlier on as being the aging member of the team. Yeah, that's um, Brendan. That's interesting what Connor says about the Tipperary half back line because any successful team over the last well ever, I suppose we'd certainly say in the last fifteen years, the trends in Hurling has been built on a very strong half back line and. You know, I personally always wondered at the aerial ability of the Maher brothers, etc. And whoever was playing, you know, with them, uh, centre back, be it Brendan Maher or whoever else. Um, do you, would you agree with Connor that perhaps they, they need to to look at the at, at the makeup of that half back line and change the way, way they're playing to Limerick proof the team? Yeah, I think so. I think the way the team is set up, I think Tipperary in the last number of years traditionally would have set up with the wing forward and wing back at least 30 yards apart for most of the match. But I'm seeing a lot of change now in that the wing forward is now supporting the wing back more. And conceding the puck out to the full back line, I think, is just showing that Tipperary were planning for later on down the road when we play, I would think, Gal or Watford in the, in the, in the Munster semi-final. Tipperary will want you to hit the ball long down top of their half back line. They're very strong there. They're really extremely good. But what they don't want you doing is creating an overlap on the opposition 65 and running it through that channel. So that's the last thing Tipperary, I suppose, would want to see. We saw it in the last 
five or six minutes in Welsh Park when the Warford players held the hurley short up around the, the, the boss of it and started running and decided they weren't going to hit it. That now is Tipperary's kryptonite as far as I can see and they will have a problem. So if they sit deeper, concede the puck out and then make them hit it, it plays to their skill set an awful lot more. I think teams as well, and you saw it a bit below in, in Welsh Park, Watford gave the puck out to Tipperary as well and I think they were trying to see can Tipperary run it out? And I think that takes Tip out of their comfort zone as well. So all these things are what's been worked on the last number of weeks by the Tipperary backroom team. I think the biggest disappointment we have in Tip is, yes, the supporters are probably saying we want to see more younger players. But if you're Liam Sheedy, every year Liam would have said, does I have a one-year plan? All right? So he wants to win this year's All-Ireland, not the one next year, the year after. And he reckons with the older guys that he has there, he'll fire them up by saying the whole country is saying we have a bunch of grandpa's playing out here lads let's show them what we can do and they'll take the paint off the wall you know so I think that's it Brian O'Mara is the only one he got injured against Limerick he's the biggest disappointment for us in tip he's an exceptionally good player now um, and I agree Paddy Cadell will play midfield I, I'm a huge supporter of his as well I think he's extremely good he hits a wallop which is what I like the most about him uh, and he'll get stuck in and he'll break a tackle uh, but overall I think if Tip's set up the right way it'll give themselves a better chance of playing. But if the half forwards, which I think should be Dan McCormack and Michael Breen, if they decide to go too far up the pitch and take on a role as the old traditional half forward, the wing backs are left out to dry. And then it's going to be like Paddy and the lads are going to be standing in the middle of a dual carriage with the cars flying past them like they've no hope. Yeah. I think something, I think something that they might be helped with as well, Mikey and Brendan would probably know this obviously a lot better uh, from on the ground and tip is that you that last year's championship and like people tend to forget they went out of last year's championship in an absolute humdinger of a game below the Gaelic grounds to Galway which kind of got forgotten largely because it was the same weekend as the bloody Sunday commemoration and it, the game was played sort of in the graveyard slot lunchtime Saturday and not too many I don't know whether too many people were paying as much attention as they should have been it was a brilliant game but I think last year's championship, they did fall a little flat. And I think that was largely a lot of their players had put in fairly tough club campaigns. Like they don't have that distraction for the want of a better word this time around. Certainly the McGraths, I think, went deep into hurling and football club championships, if I'm not mistaken. Did they go to both yeah. club finals with Lockmore, Castellani? And they won't have that this time around. So he has a, there might be a freshness to Tipperary that might help them. W would that be fair? Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, Noel McGrath and John McGrath, certainly last year, they, they, John had scored a, a point from a puck out, uh, or sorry, from a, from a 65. They were caught on a quick puck out by Barry Hogan down the field goal, and they lost the county final oh, that's in, right, yeah. in 30 seconds. Like Then they played the football final endings against um, commercials, and they're beaten again by only a couple of points. So there is certainly, last year, unusual circumstances of players playing for three months every night, every week, football and hurling. So that freshness, I think, is what Liam is going to absolutely rely on, I'd say, that this year's championship. But it also, Rory, it says that Tip need to go through the main way. The front door, yeah. yeah. They can lose a monster. Well, they can't lose that that game against Watford or, or Clare anyway. Mm. Because if they do, I think it's it's five matches in four weeks or something like that. Yeah. I don't think... They're going to be set up for that, to be honest about it. Like, you know, so they need to go the front way. Um, Connor, let's get to the, the elephant in the room, or well, not the elephant in the room, let's get to the best team in the country, the green and, giant. Yeah, the best team in the country, and what most people consider their, their closest rival and the team who probably play the closest game to them in Galway. So, Limerick and Galway, to, to break it down simplistically, play a power game, a, a kind of an almost uh. And not a new form of hurling, but a very much an advance, an advancement on what was there before. They don't worry too much about goals, even though Galway, I think, have definitely more capability to score goals than Limerick. They just look to overpower the middle of the field, win that battle, find someone free, score a point from anywhere between 90 and 60 yards. It sounds very simple. Um, most other teams, perhaps, no, they can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with that. And what you might have noticed, I suppose, a little bit is some teams, Waterford in particular, getting quite interested in looking at goals and considering that maybe this thing that Limerick have kind of have, have decided to ignore the green flag might be the only might be the only way to, to win this championship is to score a lot of goals and uh, you know make the most of any attack you get yeah but like like for me the most interesting thing about this championship is how teams will approach playing Limerick because like they hold all the all the pots and pans now like everyone is warned everybody knows how they're going to play and, you know, in my experience, inter-county hurling managers tend to be very 
busy minded people, you know, and it was a long off season for, for people like Brian Cody and Liam Sheedy and, you know, Shane O'Neill to think about Limerick and what was the best way to do it or, or how to go up and trying to stop them. And, you know, if you give Limerick 50 shots and, you, and they scored 33 points uh, and you've, you know, decided to keep your defence in the, in the shape that it's in for the whole game, if your wing backs don't track the wing forwards or if there's no sort of cover coming where you, where you find out a way to close them down out around the middle of the pitch, well, you don't have any excuse. So, so you know, I think for a long time, defences in Harlem were built to try and prevent the concession of goals. And I think to, to a large, you know, you, we see that foul now that they've just basically tried to outlaw. Um, but I think teams will probably open up a small bit in trying to deny Limerick space in the middle of the pitch. Um, because, you know, if they score, if Gerard Hegarty and, and Tom Morrissey score five points a game and Keane Lynch and you know, they allow Dermot Burns and Declan Hannan to pick their passes from that deep or even score from that deep, and they run up a huge score. Well, you know, you can't really, you can't really have any, uh, you can't say that you weren't properly warned. But the yeah. thing that's very difficult for me is the turnovers. The turnover rate in last year's All Ireland final, in terms of their physicality, the way they tackle, you know, they, they tackle quite high, they've got huge upper body strength, they don't necessarily look to, to sort of stop the player, but as long as they can slow them down, they know they can get a rook around the player. And once they do that, they can flick the ball out to the wing and there's always a player standing there to, to convert it. And last year's All-Ireland final, to my mind, was, you know, like Kenny, when they were destroying Waterford and Limerick in, in 07 and 08, it was kind of this explosion of energy and power. Whereas Limerick did it at such, I won't say they did it at their ease, but they did it in such a controlled way that it was nearly something that we hadn't seen before. And they were always on top of it. And what they need is somebody to make them think a little bit more, that they have to rely on their instincts, that they won't have measured use of the ball in the whole game. Yeah. And what that is, I haven't a clue. <laughs> um, Brendan, you know, it is, it's the, this middle third, it's, it's, it's going to be fascinating. We have a piece run this weekend from on the RT website from Sean Flynn, the, the former tip uh, stats um, video a- analyst. And he just looked at every single free. I won't go too much into it. I don't want to give it all away. He goes, every single free conceded in Division 1 of the league and what it was for. And um, by far and away, the, the, the three biggest um, the three biggest fouls are free hand tackle, the high tackle, and the push in the back, which you could argue are all one and the same. You know, kind of it's, it's kind of the cornerstone of, of a winning tactic, as Connor just su- suggested there, is, is kind of capturing, the, t- turning a man over when he has a ball in his hand, slowing him up, getting that ball turned over, be it in a free for over carrying or actually managing to dispossess him. It's a, like, it is a massive part of the game now. And John Kiley, while he retracted, you know, his apology about um, simulation with Galway, you know, he, he did make other very strong points about the refereeing and how he saw it going. And we've had Limerick players come out and admit that, you know, they've had to adapt. How big a factor is that because they are admitting you know obviously you know the way we were tackling last year is being looked at and we're going to have to change how we play do you think that is a major challenge for John Kiley and Limerick? No, I think Limerick uh, with, with Canark and the boys they're very clinical in the way they go about it mentioned it there about there's no fuss but they all have a process and a plan that they stick to so there's no doubt watching Limerick from round one of the league to round four of the league the way they're coming in with their arms is different they used to come in shoulder high then they came down to rib cage high and now they're coming in waist high. So they're, they fixed the problem. And that's the, the, that's the way sports science works. And that's the positive side of it, that you can show players, look, this is wrong. This is the way the referees are doing it. And they adapt and they change. And, and that's all part, of the, all part of the game. But I think if any team is going, to, uh, is going to get Limerick, it'll be like what Watford did last year, come out around the middle toward flooded with bodies, have yeah, two yeah. inside, leave it. Do, leave Now, if you remember the Iron final last year, right? If there was any other goalie there, Mar Nicky Quaid, Watford might have got two goals out, right? Yeah. Watford had a lot of goal chances last year. They were a bit like us in 09. They struck the ball from about 14 yards rather than going into about six yards, right? Uh, and that will make the world a difference. So if I'm one of the opposing managers looking, I'm saying, look, if we flood back out the pitch and Tip tried it for the first mm-hmm. time ever, you saw Tipperary playing with nobody inside the opposition 45. The delivery of the ball, though, for me, is still key between your own 45 and 65. 
If you're wasteful there with the ball and you don't run it through those lines and use the 10 yard pass rather than the 40 yard one, you use the 40 yard one pass there to get you on the counter attack point. But if you are more clinical or more precise in your delivery of the ball to the man closest to you, which is a lot of hot wiring players differently because players normally get the ball in their own 45, they look long. But last year as well, the last point on this thing, when they played Galway, Joe Canning was left inside on Finn who was about half a foot of a difference in height, right? Uh, Tom Morrissey was left on side on Whelan, which is at least 15 yards of pace of a difference. And Galway never hit the ball in. So if you're looking for this disturbance in the force, we'll call it of Limerick, when you look up, you have to hit the ball in when it's on. And again, it's counterintuitive to what normally an inter-county hurler does. He normally plays that short pass. I remember the All-Ireland final in 2010, obviously. Shane McGrath looked up and Larry the ball in top of Larry. Because in that split second, he noticed that Larry's marking Hickey and there's a height difference. I'll get it in. So you need players to take chances. And I think the teams that take chances against Limerick and put it in there will be the ones who get the most reward, I think, for, for the rest of this summer. And it's interesting to see who will take that chance. Just on that, sorry, Mikey. Um, yeah. That, that was the thing that amazed me last year about Limerick, that when they lost... Uh, when they lost Casey and they lost English that they ended up with um, uh, Dan Morrissey back at full back and Barry Nash at corner back and if you, did, if you said that this time last year that, that would, they'd be two thirds of the Limerick full back line you know like Dan Morrissey probably makes you full back definitely wing back I think is his best uh, position Barry Nash is a hurler you know he wants to get on the ball you would have said here the four of us or the five of us if we were having that conversation that somebody would create a mismatch on one of the days that somebody would end up uh, taking one of those players for a big score, isolating them, but nobody really did. And, and as Brendan says there, it was hard to figure out was it because the players just slotted in and did such a good job, or was it that nobody really went at that and examined that? Because if you're going to have to, if you're going to stop them in the middle of the pitch by getting bodies there, well, there's definitely going to be a couple of players, maybe not isolated, but in more space than would normally be the case. And you know, if you don't test out a fullback line that has a couple of new members to it that wouldn't normally play be playing there in the course of events, well then that was probably an opportunity missed. Yeah, Rory, we we look at Galway and we see a lot of the qualities that Limerick have, obviously not as far down the road, they're not working with their manager as long. They they have just they haven't won what Limerick have won. But they there is there's a couple of differences to what how Limerick play and you could argue that in they have a couple of forwards there who are as good as or better than anything that Limerick have, which is a hell of a statement to make. But Concannon had one hell of a league and Connor Wheeler, like they they've just got and Joe Canning we have we, we don't even mention at this point. Um they have some serious threats and if, as Brendan says, if Galway meet Limerick later in the championship and the lads around the middle third look up and there's a Connor Whelan or a Brian Concannon or even a Joe Canning in there, like they're guys who can score a goal in the blink of an eye. And that is, I, this is my theory, at least goals are what are going to beat Limerick because you're not going to have scored them points wise. No, no, you won't. Like, in fair, look, Limerick, the, the game Limerick play, I mean, there's a reason they position Aaron Galan as the sort of the, the tip of the spear more or less on his own is because he can do the job in there pretty much all by himself and leading that line but they don't really throw anybody else in there to support him and that by and large probably would explain to me why they don't score as many goals as maybe they could if they did supplement him with somebody to go in and give him a dig out but from a Galway perspective I think Galway are in a really really good position in a really good place I think they have sprinkled in a nice little uh, a nice a, a nice little drop of new blood. They've got a couple of extra, they've got an extra year into the likes of Fintan Burke, who they've moved out. I think by and large, did he play on the half back line this year? I think, I don't know, is he better suited maybe in the full back line, Brendan? I'm not too sure. Uh, Dahi Burke, um, I suppose, look, he will always find his form. I think d- defensively, they look pretty sound. Kyle Mannion is arguably the form player and uh, we'll say, you know, would be front runner for hurler of the year. I'm sure if they were picking it on the on the on the back of the league campaign, and I think they're, I think they'll find themselves in. They're, they're certainly the be, the team best positioned <clears throat> to have a really good go at this championship and possibly take down Limerick. But the, the one flip side that I suggest is like, I mean, I, I'm just not sure if they have enough coming off. Like where Limerick seem to have a massive advantage over everybody else as well is, is particularly as we head into the summer months, is um, depth. 
you know, like you, they do have, they're, they're going to have two or three um, when the ball, as I said, it is going to be a faster game. You know, your fellas are going to be out on their feet a lot quicker. We'll hopefully have supporters back, which will have the blood up a little bit more. Obviously, just 5,000 going in. That'll, you know, obviously increase the pace again. So you're you, you, heading into numbers 16, 17, 18. They're going to be very key, I would say, coming down the back stretch. And I think, again, that's where Limerick would seem to me to have a big advantage over Galway. But if you were to pair off, uh, you know, man for man, 15 versus 15, I think Galway are. 50-50 all the way in terms of being able to deal with Limerick, 100% yeah. for me. Uh, Brendan, uh, I just think it's like we've, we've touched on a few things here, the fouling, uh, the free count, um, the swarming of the middle, um, you know, a couple of things. They're all kind of feeding into this kind of culture war that's going on. Um, Vincent Hogan had an interesting piece in Connor's paper website at the weekend with a, a well, I would say Vincent raging that said said former Andrew County hurler manager wanted it, wanted to be unnamed after talking to him because he got lots of gold out of him about how he doesn't want to play the game. He doesn't he doesn't enjoy watching hurling anymore. Except with, it's a well worn argument at this stage. Rather than that, though, what I find interesting is kind of like the opposing views between Martin Fogarty, uh, kind of the the GA's protector of the game of hurling. Um, he kind of wrote a Jonathan Swift style satire about well, if you want if you want the game to flow, just just make sure to don't make anything a foul and the game will flow. Was his argument, and then he had Joe Canning on game on last week saying that he actually thinks referees assessors are are the problem with hurling because they're um they're the ones forcing referees to call up every infringement. So you've got this kind of you've got this culture where you've got like possibly one of the greatest hurlers of all time, certainly one of the greatest in the modern era, who deserves protection, saying, I don't want protection, I I want the game to flow. And you've got Martin Fogarty, who no one would think has anything but hurling's best interests at heart, saying that we really have to, you know, kind of root out systematic fouling in the game. It's quite an interesting kind of dichotomy we've got going on. It is, and 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 it's the worst. I I go back to that first game when Tip played Limerick. It was reckless watching it on the on the telly. The amount of freeze, we're all going, my God, the game is dying in front of our eyes. But I think it's it's mellowed a bit as we as we've gone on. You look at Joe Canning, like he got a fence off of Paddy Maher in a game above in Crow Park, and Paddy nearly drove one shoulder out to the other. That wasn't a tackle on the ball. And the player who received that tackle is saying, Look, the game's okay, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, that's the way the thing is. Right now, it, at the start of the league, that tackle could have got somebody jailed like you know. I, know, <laughs> I, I think. I think now it has mellowed. I think referees now are starting to put their character across the game. I don't think with a ball the size of what it is, you can really go black and white on rules. We're trying to do it in the spirit of the game as we go along as well. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it's it has balanced itself out. Yes, there was knee-jerk reactions if you go onto Twitter any day of the week. You can see that everything's a disaster. Everything's good. Take a pick, depending on who you're following. Um, but I think the game has... Uh, has I'd say balance itself out to where I'd like to see it. And I hope going in now to this championship weekend that we will see that common sense, that arm going up in the air to apply a bit of an advantage where we see a, a player has a chance to express himself and all that. And uh, I, I I don't see hurling on that life support machine that I saw in the first couple of rounds of the league, to be honest with you. Although yeah. everybody's entitled to the famous opinion and all, I just think the cut and trust of hurling is thrown in and let mad it and, uh, and, uh, Everything will be will be okay, I think, in the long run. I wonder though, and I wonder, could I just ask everybody's view on this? Was there any hint of irony in Martin Fogarty, Martin Fogarty's um, interview that time? I mean, now look, people can take this for what it is. In my view, Kilkenny are largely responsible for the way the game is officiated these days. Um, they changed this, the rules of engagement by and large, with you know, the upper body tackling and a lot of the pulling and dragging that we all th seem to find so... He doesn't represent Kilkenny anymore, or he represents well, the game of hurling. Yeah, I know, but at the same time, you know, I, I just, I'm just, I'm just wondering, was there an element of irony here, you know, in terms of running with the hare, hunting with the hounds, like at this, like, you, you, the game changed. The rules of, of engagement have changed. I think crying over it now 15 years later is a bit late and at this point. If you are concerned about fouling and the interpretation, then redefine all of those things in the rule book. But until that's done, I think the game is now, what we have now is what we will have for the foreseeable future. I think the big issue, personally speaking, is the stop-start nature. And some of the issues around that are coming from 
water breaks, which is two stoppages. You then have situations where frees now are being awarded in a half back line. So you have Patrick Hargan jogging 60 meters out, which chews up another minute off the clock to tap the ball over the bar from 100 meters. And same with Tipperary doing the opposite direction with Jason Ford, who can bang it over the bar from 100 meters. And that's running down the clock. It's eating up time. It's making the game like more stop start and there isn't as much flow. I think all of those things are issues as well as the interpretation around the tackle. And I just thought it was a little bit ironic coming from a sort of a Kilkenny source that, you know, we're cribbing about how the interpretation around the tackle is now being applied. Yeah, we were just on the tackle there. Like we were on the league Sunday there a couple of weeks ago and um, we said seven Derrick and we we were looking and Joanne was looking up the rule book as to, defining the tackle when we wanted to yeah. try to get clarity yeah. on the night you're already there. Yeah. And like, yeah. There's that much for the tackle in Ireland <laughs> and there yeah. is that much for the tackle in football. football. So I think yeah. at the end of the year, mm. it'd be a really good exercise for the GA to sit down, get the, the, I suppose, all the stakeholders in, managers, players, past players, what administrators, of course, will have to be there and say, right, lads, let's have a look at the tackle. Let's look through this. And can we actually define the tackle? I think by the time they're finished, they'll go, well, oh, we can't really define the tackle and we just move on. But at least we'll have an open, <laughs> Classic GA open, solution. <laughs> an open and frank conversation where all the stakeholders are involved. I think that a lot of the ire coming, or coming from the players is that we didn't know any of this was going on. Who passed this in Congress? Where's all this coming from? Yeah. Was all I heard. And that's a frustration. And then there becomes a separation between those playing the sport and those who are at the top brass, who we call the, the suits, uh, we're looking down for the for the good of the game stuff. So I think if the two of those start talking to each other, uh, then I think we'll have we'll have more clarity, and then we won't have as much yeah. chaos. On that, uh, Connor, what do you think that, that speaking of rules and bringing it back to the context of this championship and what we were just talking about, Limerick and Galway, do you think the stricter enforcement of the tackle and the new advantage law, hated as it is, and the black card penalty rule, do you think that will have any? kind of impact on leveling a playing field if there is a leveling a playing field that needs to be leveled between Limerick Galway and the rest of the field no because we've got two very good free takers so I mean it, you know like it, it's a big thing but I, that element of it you know the severity or the number of frees that are awarded like I, I, everyone was losing their marbles in the first couple of rounds yeah. of the league and I remember no, thinking set us down. I remember thinking back to last year's league remember Dublin played Wexford in the game in Crow Park and, and Johnny Murphy awarded 50 frees that's right yeah and we, like you know, we were all we were all putting on the black suits to go to Hurling's <laughs> funeral, you know, the following day. But like it happens every year. It does. The, the, the issue with Hurling, like mm. f- <laughs> fundamentally, is that when the game has been played at its best, say go back to the games that Brendan Cummins played in against Kilkenny at the early part mm. uh, ten years ago, thirteen years ago. Those games, if you had somebody who'd never seen Hurling before and gave them a rule book and told them to watch those games, they tell you, well, that the rule book isn't being particularly closely applied. But it worked because there was a kind of general acceptance as to exactly. what kind of was a free yeah. and what kind of wasn't a free. But we're now exist in this grey area where teams are actually trying to exploit the absence of specificity in the rule book. So you have a situation where as Brendan sort of spoke about how the Limerick players tackle and you know they're going in with their hands down here trying to hold up a player. But the number of games that I was at in the league where a player will go in and try and stop a player doing that. And if the player is physically stronger than the opposition player, the other guy will go down and will be a free. Whereas if he's not and he does the same act, there's no free. So yeah. Yeah, you have a situation where because this fella is bigger or stronger or the other fella is off balance or the other fella went down, which players are doing now an awful lot more than they used to do, a free is being given despite the fact that it's essentially the same tackle. So we're in a... F- just to think a strange place with regard to the kind of contact that's going on now is different from the kind of contact that went on 10 years ago because teams realise that, you know, I mean, how many clean dispossessions do you see with a flick of a hurley in the game? Very, very few. You don't even see, you don't even see block downs or hooks. You yeah. don't even see block downs or hooks that much anymore, Connor. It's very rare you see a block down or yeah, a hook. Stop, stopping a player, halting his run, making him deviate his run. They're all considered to be tackles now. And as we know, team managers are obsessed with tackle counts. They're, they're, they're like tackle counts and um, turnovers and conversion rates are the two, are the three statistics that most inter-county managements live and die by at the moment. And if, you, if, you're, if you're a player and you're given very clear instructions and you're being told that the way you tackle now is try and hold up a player, halt his run, stop him, slow him down, as opposed to trying to clean dispossess him, that's where we get this very, very strange grey area. And that's why it's very difficult for referees. But what tends to happen 
and I hope again that this does happen and I suspect it will is everybody reaches this kind of middle ground where we're all kind of happy but kind of not happy with it at the same time and you get through this all. Um, Brendan, just on that, do you think that the, the new rules as they are, will they have any impact on, on the, the, the outcome of the championship specifically? Will, will they impact on Limerick more than anybody else? No, I don't think so. I think Limerick have adapted. Every team has adapted now. They all know the, they all know the crack as it were. Um, and and I, every intercounty manager now, and I know I was involved with Kerry, the first thing I'm asking about a player sitting in front of me is, can you break a tackle? If you can't break a tackle or can't stop someone coming at you, then you start to fall down the pecking order a bit. And I think what happened then was that was refined to, can you tackle with the correct technique? And can you take, are you coachable? And obviously all the players now at this elite level are coachable. And so they will, yeah, I think you'll still see the hits, you'll still see the wallops, you'll still see the, oh my God, that's a free or shouldn't have been a free stuff. But I don't think we'll see it as often as we saw in the early rounds of the league. So I'd be happy enough that common sense has been applied across it now and away we go. And I don't think in that Ireland final, to be honest with you, there's going to be 40 frees or anything like that to be fair so no I think we're at an even playing field and if Limerick win the All-Ireland again this year it can't be because they were tackling worse than anybody else yeah. I just think one 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 final point there Mikey before because I know we haven't really talked about Leinster all that much one final point on this that I do think maybe might be playing a certain background role is I mean Connor referenced um, the brilliant games the trilogy between Kilkenny and Tip and you know the absolute flake fests that they were and it was basically throw the ball in swallow the whistle and away you go um I think in the 10 years since and absolutely no this this is absolutely no disrespect to uh, the specimens that ye were back then Brendan right but I do think maybe been in the 10 years since there's been a huge emphasis on conditioning and what you now have at inter-county level is six foot two six foot three inch muscle monsters running into each other at you know like you know 60 70 kilometers an hour and hitting each other at a for like i mean I'm for not instance, quite that fast huh? well well like like if you look at if you look at um we'll say when jackie and shamey cal in that famous uh 2009 final when you know there was a sort of a meeting a meeting at the okay corral you know the two lads basically just ran straight head on in you're now dealing with lads that are you know much more much better uh, developed in terms of their physical sense and the potential for injury is probably a lot greater and the potential for serious injury for amateur players and i'm just wondering if I'm not saying they would say this explicitly, but there could be a sort of a, you know, a background, little bit of a whispering sort of going on to say, listen, we need to tighten up here or somebody could get really seriously hurt, you mm. know? Um, you mentioned Leinster. We haven't spoken about it. A quick, before, a quick word uh, before we get on to this weekend's games because we're, we're running out of time. Uh, Brendan, uh, your, your old foes, Kilkenny, um, we, we hate the word transition, so we won't say that. We'll just say, Brian Cody doesn't have as good a team to play with as he used to have, does he? Oh, <laughs> well, I'm saying they're in transition. Yeah, I don't think so. I just think Brian Cody picks a team that'll win the Ireland that year. And if all the rest of us looking in want to take a scientific approach and say he's transitioning or he's plotting or he's planning, he's, a, he's not. He's just taken the best of the, with the greatest respect, the best dog he can find in a Kilkenny jersey that's going to work his backside off, he's going to hoop, block, break tackles, kill somebody to get the ball, get to themselves. That's the template, like. You can put sports science around this all you like. It's just the size of the fight in the player, and that's what he looks at. And after that, then, we'll see can he play hurling. And that's kind of the way, for me, it's been. And TJ Reid then will pot every free, so he'll score 10 or 11 points a game. You're sure he's going to hit them over the bar. Probably score a goal. So you're about 113 up before you even start. And if you think about the Kilkenny team in 2019 to beat Limerick, I think it blew up all the stats engines about work rate. The GPS has literally nearly melted off those players' backs. And that's how they bet Kilkenny. Sheer work rate. Now, they have skill. Don't get me wrong. But Brian Cody and Fairstam, he knows how to find players of character. And he'll find them and he'll put them out. And that's why they've topped their group, obviously, with a game to spare. And uh, they'll just do the same thing over and over again. No change here in the last 15, 20 years, as far as I can see. You'd have to expect, Connor, that they will be playing Wexford next week, the weekend after this. Would you? Do, can you see any way for Leash to, to trouble Davy Fitz's team, even if Wexford aren't hitting the heights of a couple of years ago? No, not off the basis of the league form anyway, which is all we can really go on. Um, like Leash have the same sort of quality hurlers, but they just probably don't have quite enough of them. Like I, you take Ross King or Paddy Porcel in any team that you're putting together, but. Um, 
No, like, like Wexford, I don't think of a great league either. They, they, you know, the game against Dublin was kind of a game of two teams that were looking pretty unsteady on their feet. And I think uh, maybe Wexford took advantage of the fact that Dublin were maybe playing in such a way that they were gearing themselves up for championship matches. You know, like they, you know, they, they kind of vacated the space either side of Liam Rush um, and dragged the Dublin half backs into midfield and then put puck outs down and made. Uh, rush chase uh, O'Connor either side of them, and they and they got a fair few scores off that. But um, I'm, I, it, it's just it's hard to see Wexford coming back from such a bad year last year. It, it tends not to happen, you know. I know there was a bit of the you know let's finish what we started, but they came back so far last year. I think it's probably a bigger job to get them back to where they were the previous year. Um, and in the absence of three or four new players to kind of freshen that up in a big way. Uh, I'm not sure that they're going to this year. I don't think they'll win Leinster, but I do think they'll beat Leash. Yeah, yeah, okay. I- I'll take that for now, and we'll we'll, we'll mention Gilkenny next week. Um, I'll, I'll stay with you, Connor, because there's bad news coming out of Dublin uh, last night. Obviously, um, Trollier is out for the the season, but looks things with an Achilles injury, which is which is a major blow, isn't it? Massive blow. It is in so far as that uh, what Trollier gives Dublin is um, something that they don't have very much of, which is a goal threat. Um, yeah. You know, there are games where he can stand in the corner and he can find it hard to get the ball in his hand. But when he does, he's lightning. And when he gets turned, he has a very low center of gravity. He's impossible to stop. Even to foul him is tough because he's traveling so quickly. Um, so he's a big, big absence. Like last year, he found it hard to get in the team. And then he came on against Kilkenny and I think he scored four or five points. But himself and Ronan Hayes look like they've paired off as a as a as a good inside duo. Um, you see with Dublin, they they drop Donald Burke back into midfield, and he kind of takes scores from long range. So they're going to have to find somebody else, and the, they're not way down with options there. Um, I suspect that Mark Shute will probably go in there. I think Shute's best years with Kula were as a, one of the inside duo with Con O'Callaghan, and he's much quicker than a man of his size should be. But you know, he's had injury issues over the last couple of years and probably hasn't had a big run of games. So um, other than that, you're going down to a fella called Keno Sullivan, who was on the squad years ago under Jer Cunningham and kind of came back. He's a similar kind of player to Trollier in so far that he's quick and he's direct. Um, but Dublin are not the sort of team at the moment that could um, easily swallow, I think, the loss of one of their better forwards. No, it's it's an interesting venue and everything, Rory, isn't it? That they're playing Antrim yeah. in in Navin, 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 Navin an Ulster hurling championship match in in Navin, and this this one probably when the fixtures came out uh, at the start of the year, you would have said Do- Dublin will win that Antrim will will, will will give them plenty, but Dublin will get through and they, they'll get the opportunity to be beaten by Galway in the semi final. It's not that clear now at all, is it? No, and I think there's one big, uh, there's one other caveat that I think was is worth throwing into the mix. They met in the league, obviously in Parnell Park, which Dublin won by six or seven, if I'm not mistaken. Connor, like it was a comfortable enough win for the for Dublin. But I watched that game. Um, I was wor- working on League Sunday at the time, and I've seen it, m- nearly all of Antrim's games, bar one now, and it, there was a sense. That Antrim were maybe playing a little bit within themselves in advance of a championship meeting, and that they will that they plowed everything into the teams that they weren't going to be coming across in, in with the mindset that look, um, let's measure ourselves against the Clare Kilkenny's and and then really go after this championship fixture. Yeah, I, I think Rory, I think it was their it was their third game in three weeks. Um, yeah, and you know that only I know it was everybody's third game in three weeks, but for Antrim, um, from the level they were coming from particularly given the fact that teams only got three or four weeks of collective yeah. training before the first round. I think three weeks in a row was always going to be a stretch. And they were actually very competitive in that game yeah. uh, up until, I'd say, 45, 50 minutes, and then Dublin kind of took over. Um, so, like, like, they are a good hurling team. They're improving in a big way. They're, I think they're big men give them a lot. The, the, the issue that they might have coming against it is that I think Dublin have maybe the best fullback in the country, you know, and O'Donnell, yeah. the who, without whom, I think they would have had a completely disastrous league. You know, He's not mm. just very physical. He's not just very quick. His instincts are brilliant for a fullback. He knows, mm. when to, he knows when to go in front of the man. He knows when to stand in behind. He knows when to foul. He knows when not to. So um, I think with him and with Rush back to six, I think Dublin actually have quite a solid spine, particularly if they you know, make sure that Rush doesn't get kind of exposed with one, some of the quicker players that are out there. But I don't think Antrim really have those threats 
Um, but I, I think again, it, like I think it comes down to the mindset be, coming yeah, into the game. Like, but it will be it will be competitive. I'd say, Connor. Ah, yeah, it'll, yeah, be, yeah, it'll yeah. be a very competitive game. It'll be one of the more interesting matches over the course of the weekend mm. across all ten games. And anyway. look, you'd, you'd expect Dublin to win, but I don't think it's a gimme. No, not at all. Um, final word to you, Brendan. Then on the match in your in your in your old uh, your old field in Central Stadium, we have um, we have obviously Waterford and Clare in the quarter final of the Munster Championship. Um, big blow. Shane O'Donnell being out joining Patrick O'Connor on, on the sideline for Clare. Do you, do you, do you think that could actually be pivotal? Because it was a bit of a you could have put a cigarette paper between them. You could argue, but that that might actually just tip it in favour of the day. Should does it? Yeah, it does. I think, and with the momentum that Watford have as well, and the goal scoring threat they have, with Daisy Hutchinson inside. Now, there's also little bits of rumours that Jamie Barron might make it. I think Prunty and Austin Leeson will be okay, but I don't think Barron will be okay for it. Um, either way, I still always have fancied Watford. Watford have under Liam Cahill. They've gotten that little piece of the jigsaw that was missing inside 25 yards of the opposition goals, which is a goal scoring threat. Now, last year, Daisy and Stephen. Bennett were the two. And I think Shane Bennett this year has added an extra bit of X factor to them. And uh, guys who can carry the ball, who are get you one-on-one, -on -one, can win their own ball and go past you, that kind of thing. So I just think that the momentum Watford have and the, and the way they're playing the game uh, means that I think they, they will have too much for Clare again. I don't think it'll be like we saw in Pocky Keeve last year where Clare just simply didn't, didn't turn up. Um, but I think this time it'll be closer. But I do think Watford will, will have enough to be Clare the weekend. Okay, we're just out of time. So, in a word, everybody, who's going to win the All Ireland? I'll go first. Limerick can't pick the same as me. <laughs> Connor, Galway, Brendan, Limerick, Rory, and I, I do. I think if Waterford get over this weekend, which I think is going to be a tough game for them, uh, and they, if they can get a run going, I, I think they, I think they might finally, um, they might finally end the famine. Waterford, yeah. Oh, Jesus, this is this is one to pull out for social media anyway. We'll keep this one in the back pocket for August. Um, thank you to Connor and Brendan. Um, that game at Semple Stadium is live on RTE television. We'll have commentaries from across both both codes on both days on Saturday Sport and Sunday Sport on RTE Radio 1. And we'll, as always, we'll have live blogs of all the games, match reports, reaction, columns, everything else you want on the RTE website and the news app. So thank you very much to the lads and uh, everybody enjoy the first round of championship and we'll see you next week. Good night. Crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a score. Oh, there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar.